Labyrinth Runners is a unique episode of this show in that it has no King, no Ida, and not even Luz. That a show like this can manage to sustain an entire episode without three of its most important characters, without it ever coming off like a gimmick or a one-off, very much speaks to the depth of the show's supporting cast. Now, admittedly, the show has been a little uh, sporadic with how it's allotted time to each of these supporting players, perhaps owing to the fact that there are just so many of them that the show, especially at two seasons, but even if it had three, really does not have the time to really go in depth in regards to these characters, and in fact, it's a bit unpredictable which characters are going to pop up and have more screen time. It's hard to know who's a really central character and who's just someone who's along for the ride. Now, there are characters who are conventionally important to the main plot here, such as Amity and, of course, Hunter. But there's a lot of time and energy given to fleshing out the stories of the characters who have gotten less screen time as the show has progressed and gotten increasingly darker and more dramatic, most notably Willow and Gus, both of whom have gotten some attention this season, but certainly not nearly as much as they got in season one. This is, of course, a part of the show's growing pains. Season one of the show was significantly different and not really representative of the show at its best. It was lighthearted, comedic, a bit meandering. Much more of a parodic version of the wizarding school idea that has been around for a long time but was popularized in the mainstream consciousness with Harry Potter than its own adventure in his own right. But that has very much changed as we've gone into Season 2, introduced Hunter, made Balos a much more threatening villain, and approached the Day of Unity. We saw some of Willow in Any Sport in a Storm, and we saw some of Gus back earlier in Season 2. But allowing these characters to develop naturally and organically while also integrating them into the Hunter plot is a stroke of genius by the show, and what could have seemed contrived and a bit arbitrary instead seems rather thoughtful and elegantly constructed. Hunter coming here makes sense considering his uncertainty about his future, considering that he doesn't want to really impose on anyone like Luz, and considering he doesn't really have a clear grasp of his own identity right now, but he has fond memories of the school, so he just stays there. Admittedly, he could have picked a better approach instead of just hiding in books and garbage <laughs> with nothing but the aid of his little adorable palisman for support, but considering the circumstances he has endured, it's reasonable that he's a bit frazzled right now. So in this episode, we get to bring back a lot of our old Hexide folk, while also seeing Hunter process the tumult that he has endured, his entire image of Balos and his mission of the Day of Unity, the mission that Hunter dedicated himself to, has all been shattered, and now Hunter needs to struggle to reform a sense of self and a basic level of coherence and orientation. And this was a great way to do that. It's possible that he could be a major leader in the school in the run-up to the Day of Unity, which is coming up very soon. We are three episodes away from the end of Season 2, and from the episode descriptions that we've gotten, it seems as though 
the last episode in Season 2 is going to be the one wherein the Day of Unity starts. I suspect we're going to be left on a sort of cliffhanger before our three big specials that close off the show. Hunter knows a lot about Balos at this point. He knows a lot about Balos' past, and he knows about the Day of Unity. While I thought someone like Luce would be the one to break the news to the characters we've seen before, having Hunter do it is a great choice. Luce has a lot to deal with right now, especially since she, Ida, and King are on the run, their house having been surrounded by the Emperor's lackeys, and Luz having to adjust to knowing that King is the Titan, and also that people like Balos and the Collector are probably going to come after King because of that once they know who he is. So they're all tied up in those intricacies, leaving Hunter who is socially awkward, a bit isolated, and not really used to forming connections with others, to be the one to reveal the truth about the Day of Unity. No one in the school has a particularly high opinion of Balos or the Coven system at this point, and I suspect the illusion Covenhead, who is this wonderfully smarmy film director type, coming to try and impose covens on these people without their consent probably did not help the coven system's reputation, but there's a difference between thinking that the system is kind of cruel and restrictive and thinking that it is going to end up killing everyone. <laughs> it's this wild death cult at this point, just fueled by Balos' resentment. Far worse than I think a lot of us were anticipating. So, at the end of this episode, we see Hunter reveal the truth to everyone, and... Because he knows more about Balos than others, he's probably going to be a major one... Forming all these strategies and positions... And leading the group to meet up with Luz and company for the major assault of Balos to perhaps try to stop the Day of Unity, or... If the Day of Unity does happen, which it looks like it will, to some degree, to stop Balos before he can kill everyone on the Boiling Isles, which, you know, probably a good thing. Mass genocide, not something that we should support. But much more interesting to me is Hunter's fractured sense of self. He is left with a very weak and fragmented idea of who he is and what he wants for himself. His very sense of self has been raised to this position of constant flux and change and transition. He cannot hold himself to a single conception of himself and the world around him. People he thought were his enemies have turned out to be very sweet and compassionate and understanding. Not all of them. There are some jerks at Hexide, as we see, who are not as willing to accept him, but people like Willow stand by him, and he really supports that. Not to mention, of course, that he's clearly fallen in love with her at this point, <laughs> which is also very adorable. And, of course, on the much more negative side, Balos, who really gave Hunter his sense of self-worth, the sense of value, the position Balos gave him, and the acclaim Balos gave him really made Hunter feel that he was worth something on this world, despite not having access to magic, unlike the vast majority of other people that we see in this world. Though Hunter does not really know what he wants at this point, he knows what he does not want. He does not want to return to Balos, because he knows that if he does, he will die. It's a death sentence. He knows what Balos does to Golden Guards who betray him, who do not follow his exact orders. And Hunter has broken Balos' trust by learning the truth about what Balos plans to do 
Not just with him, but with the entire world at this point. So, Hunter needs to live. Not just for the obvious reasons, but because living is the only way he can give himself the chance to determine his identity, to complete the process of transformation and questioning and trying to understand the world around him and his own sense of values that he is going through right now. It's something that's really reminiscent to me of Sartre, who talks a lot about how in response to thinkers like Heidegger, who'd oversimplify greatly, thought that our being, our basic sense of self and relationality to the world is defined in relation to death, Sartre talks about how that cannot really ever be the case because life, being alive, having the ability to make choices for oneself is how we constantly form our sense of self and that's how we define our being in the world. It is not something that can occur once we're dead or really have anything to do with death because death is the extinguishing of the possibilities for us to constantly be reinventing ourselves, to constantly be evolving and changing and incorporating new information we learn. Only when we're alive can we determine ourselves not just as this fixed body of knowledge and actions and choices that others see us as, but as someone who can constantly and is always constantly negotiating and determining who we really are. Anyway, the vignette with Willa was especially charming. I was a little suspicious of how she interacted with him at first, and at first I thought that was just a weird characterization choice, but the fact that it was intentional, and that Hunter knows she's acting weird and thus knows it's not really her, is a really nice and clever writing choice. I love the respect he gives her, not just care and affection, but real respect. I love that he keeps calling her the captain. He's in awe of her in a way, which probably makes Willow feel great considering the lack of respect she's used to getting. But the two of them are going to be major leaders in this rebellion against Balos, especially considering the truth they now know and considering how vital it is for them to come together and form a coherent strategy to beat back the darkness before it overtakes them. So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this before anyone else. Keep watching The Owl House. I'm really fascinated by what the show is doing. The fact that I can take an episode like this that does not seem like it's necessarily a major episode in the show, like one of the most important episodes of the show, like Hollow Mind, and still make it as affecting a description of Hunter's mental state as it is, is a real testament to the quality of this show. Anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. It will be coming soon, I promise you that. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.